the U.S. is going to polls this year. It looks like it's going to be a 2020 rematch, Joe Biden versus Donald Trump. Uh, and the result is going to impact not just the U.S., but the whole world. So what will, we, what will a second Trump presidency look like? And uh, how will America's relationship with India evolve if that were to be the case? Uh, joining me is a leader who's been a core member of the first Trump administration and who's also tipped to play some sort of a role in the second one if that happens. Uh, former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, welcome to First Post. Sir. Okay, it's great to be with you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So let me start with the question that everyone wants an answer to. Do you think that you will be Donald Trump's running mate? Oh, goodness. Uh, you know, I, 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 who knows? I, I don't comment on jobs I've not been offered. Um, there are a number of great people who would do fantastic work uh, as his running mate. Uh, first, first things first, he's got to get organized, get ready, and it's really important to the world, in my view, uh, that he's successful. He runs a winning campaign and he indeed becomes president. Who's his vice president? Much less important. Would you be open to the idea if it were to be offered to you? You know, I've said uh, many times, if, uh, if I'm offered a job and I think I can serve America in some way and make an impact, I would absolutely do it. You would endorse Trump as the next president? Oh, I already have. I have. I've, been, I've been out talking about the good work that we did for, what, almost three and a half years now. <laughs> I wanted to ask you again because a lot of Mr. Trump's former uh, cabinet colleagues are not exactly on good terms with him. We've seen uh, Mike Pence, who's not endorsed him, uh, the likes of Nikki Haley, Bill Barr, Jim Mattis, uh, Mark Esper. Uh, so the question arises that, that how is it that you still sort of have a good working relationship with him? We did remarkable work together. He was a great boss in the sense of um, we had a vision for America's place in the world, uh, the things we knew we could uh, do and do well. Uh, we, we knew how to solve problems. Uh, we didn't solve all of them. We had, we had things that we didn't succeed on as well. Uh, but the, the way that um, I worked alongside him, first as CI director and then as a Secretary of State, was to appreciate what it was he told the American people he would do. I said, I will go do X and then work every day to get us closer to achieving that, to deliver against the promises that we made. And if, if I look back on the four years of one of the things I'm most proud of, it's that we, we never lost that focus, putting, putting the American people and what President Trump promised them during his campaign in 2016 at the center of our mission. As the former CIA chief and then uh, Secretary of State, I'm sure you also worked uh, closely with the Indian leadership. Uh, what was your impression? And, and those same leaders are still in office, <laughs> Prime Minister Modi and Minister Jay Shankar and, and uh, the NSA uh, chief. Are there any particular interactions that come to mind? Is, is there something that you want to share with us and our audience? Well, first, I'm hopelessly biased. I love them both <laughs> uh, and enjoyed working with them, mostly because they're incredibly professional and capable. And they put India first. They are, they are diligent about understanding the things that the Indian people need. Uh, and so Foreign Minister Jay Shankar is among the, my closest former colleagues. Um, I didn't work as directly with the Prime Minister, although I met him many times and traveled with the President to see him. Um, but we always knew we had a friend, someone who was going to vigorously defend their own interests. And that meant we didn't always agree, for sure. But we knew we had a good, responsible counterparty that was working on many of the same things we were to make life better for the people of their own country and people of the world. I'm so happy they're still there. I don't do internal politics in other countries. That's for the Indian people to sort out. But if you ask me as someone who was working on national security issues, I can say that the Indian people were incredibly well represented by both the Prime Minister and Foreign Minister Jishankar. And we've also seen India grow, you know. It remains one of the fastest growing major economies. It's also playing an important role on the world stage uh, as a host of the G20 last year and other fields. Uh, how do you think that this leadership has led India? What is your impression? Oh, no doubt. Um, they have uh, continued what has been a, a progression in India. And now they are a critically important global player, a, a critically important global player uh, regionally, in the Indian Sea, in the South Pacific, in the challenges that we all confront from the Chinese Communist Party, a, a critical player in economic matters, which are really at the center of security, uh, incredible economic partner for the United States. So many uh, Americans doing business here. I did business here in the early 2000s. I, I ran a machine shop uh, outside of Hyderabad, Chennai, uh, for many years, so I know this country well. Uh, India is taking its rightful place on the global stage, and I, as an American, am counting on India to be a great partner to America to meet the threats for the next 10, 15, and 50 years. 
Was there a difference in your, uh, you know, interactions with India or uh, as a business person or as a business leader, uh, you say in the early 2000s compared to what it's like now? Oh my goodness, yes. Oh no, no, the country, this so what, 20 years on, uh, India is a very different place today. Uh, it's a very different place. Uh, and, and you, you know, you, it's just, uh, if you took 20, 2000 India and 2025, uh, India, very different places, growing, thriving, prospering, uh, people of all classes rising. Uh, it's pretty remarkable what's taking place here, and the world knows that, uh, and importantly, the world is benefiting from it as well. What is your assessment of where uh, the India-U.S. relationship is at the moment? I think it's pretty good still. Um, I know I don't do politics when it comes to national security things. I, I think the current administration has done a good job of continuing to build out the relationship with India. Uh, the Quad too is an important part of American security model for the region. Uh, we, for Mr. Jay Shankar and I, began to put legs underneath that uh, as COVID was ripping through the world. And this administration has continued to build upon that. I, I think the relationship is still good. Um, having said that, I note that what happened in Afghanistan, I think the Indian people and Indian leadership saw as a failure of America uh, to withdraw from Afghanistan in that way and allow the Taliban uh, to maraud in the way that they marauded. They killed 13 Americans and now has resulted in lives for you know Afghan women being just terrible and the security risks to the region, to India in particular, are greater. I think Indian leadership recognized that that was a U.S. failure under this administration. Is that how you see it as well? And do you think you would have done something differently? Oh, I know we would have. I mean, we did. <laughs> I don't have to guess about this one. Um, for four years, we endeavored to reduce our footprint in Afghanistan. Uh, President Trump very much wanted to, to do that, to take down American risk and cost there. And we did that. We did it successfully. Uh, and all the while, we maintained American interest there. We r remained and retained the counterterrorism capabilities that were there at Bagram Air Base. Um, we, we did all those things in a way that was responsible and demonstrated the best of America. And President Biden came in and just took a, a very different path, and the chaos followed. How should the next administration approach Afghanistan? It's difficult now. It's difficult because the assets that we had there are no longer ours. And to get them back is a very complex problem set. I don't want to talk about some of the things that I know we were working on, um, but suffice it to say, the risk from Afghanistan is greater today than when it's been three and a half years now. So three and a half years ago, when I walked out the door at the State Department, the risk from Afghanistan, not only to in India, but to Pakistan, to the region, and indeed to the United States of America, is far greater than it was when we left. And we need to, with partners in the region, including the countries of Central Asia, work to restore a model that delivers that security again. Uh, you mentioned Quad and you've called India a wild card in the past in the Quad because of it, India's non-aligned past and yeah, strategic autonomy. Of course, would you, would yeah. you still call India the wild card? No, I, I wouldn't. I, I, don't, I don't think that would any longer represent. I think there's a commitment there now that is different than it was five, six, seven years ago to that enterprise. I think Indians' leadership have come to see the value of it. They've come to learn that they can not only be part of it, but lead it and be an important leader as part of it. You'll remember one of the biggest challenges that we faced was that uh, Japan and the Republic of Korea were at each other's throats over some long forgotten history. And now they're in a better place when for Mr. Jay Shankar and I were working on it. No, I wouldn't. I would now call them a central part of it and a committed partner as part of it and someone who understands why it's in India's best interest to continue to build that model out. There's a lot going for the India-US relationship, but there are not some not so good parts as well. Like, for instance, we've just rolled out a new citizenship law called the CAA. And uh, the US government has said that it's concerned about this issue and it will monitor it. Uh, do you agree with this statement? Well, our, our approach to Trump administration approach was very different to these kinds of things. I don't want to talk about this specifically, but I'll give you, uh, I'll give you a model. Our model was we had a lot more space for leaders, especially in democracies, places like India, right, the world's largest democracy. We had a lot of tolerance for democracies fighting it out politically amongst themselves and coming to a resolution that made sense for their country. It might be a model that was different than the American model. It might be the same, but we had a lot of space for that. Uh, I'll give you an even more recent example. We had uh, the most senior Jewish official in the U.S. government in all of history attack 
a fellow democracy. Because, I, I don't even know the because, that is fundamentally indecent. We should allow leaders in democratic nations a lot of latitude to model their country on a model that works for them. Economically, culturally, militarily, pro the, the prosperity model for them will be different than ours often. We should, we should give them all kinds of space. Uh, and so I've seen the critiques from this administration with respect to that particular set of rules. Uh, I think India is quite capable of figuring that out themselves. Uh, I'll come to Israel in a bit, and you say that you gave more latitude, but I think some of these uh, assessments and reports on, on freedom of religion and freedom of press and so on and so forth that, that come out of the U.S. did come out under the Trump administration as well. Oh, sure. If you were Secretary of State today, uh, would you raise this or would you endorse the statements uh, that have come from the State Department? I don't know. I, I'm not tracking the statements closely. I, I, I can't. I, I can tell I, I can't you what they But, but no, I'll, say, I'll say this for sure. Um, we, religious freedom does matter. Uh, it, it matters to, to human beings, whether as a Christian, a Hindu, or Muslim. Religious freedom matters. The capacity to worship in the way one chooses, or to choose not to worship, is truly important to human dignity. And so I... I made no, there's, you don't have to read me anything, I made no bones about the fact that religious freedom was really important to the United States and we think countries are stronger when there is religious freedom and so we would root for every nation to certainly have that. Yes, it's just that the religious freedom report, uh, as far as I understand, does not mention uh, or does not give an assessment of religious freedom in the U.S., but it does talk about everyone else. Oh my and, gosh, and <laughs> make no mistake about it. Um, religious freedom is at risk in our country too. I, I work. I worry about it there as well. We shut down churches during COVID. We are not above critique or criticism inside the United States of America as well. The report is a statutory requirement. We're, we're required to comment on things not American State Department report, not a U.S. domestic report. But if you ask Mike personally, um, do I think the United States needs to do better in its protecting of religious freedom? The answer is absolutely yes. Okay. And you will not talk about the CEA? No, I, I'll, I'll leave that to another time. Who knows, I, I might have some capacity to do that in an official position one day, and I want to make sure I understand it thoroughly and completely before I opine on any specific matter. You mentioned in your book that India and Pakistan came close to a nuclear exchange after the Indian airstrikes in Balakot, yeah. uh, and you wrote about uh, the American uh, intervention at that time. What exactly did officials on both sides tell you then? I, I can't go into the details, um, but it was a, si a serious matter. It was of, of real concern. Anytime you have two uh, nuclear capable nations in conflict, one worries a great deal that there will be misunderstandings. That's the biggest risk. It's not that they will do something that, that fits the time and fits the moment, but rather that they will come to have perceptions that don't accord with the reality. And so the task was to make sure everybody understood what was actually happening, what was actually not happening, and make sure that the level heads prevailed. And in fact, they did on both sides. On, it, was, it was actually a well-handled issue. It just took a little while, and you know, we, were all, we were all making sure we moved quickly. Were you at any point uh, concerned that Pakistan may use nukes? I'm always worried about any. I, I worry. There, there's no greater issue that President Trump and I focused on than nuclear proliferation. The risk of an error, of a mistake, of weapons getting someplace they shouldn't be, of a fail-safe not properly being handled, it, it's always there. So I, if you say, was I worried in that moment, um, yeah, I, but I'm, I, that's what I do. You're, you're, the, the job is to address risk and take it down, and that's what we did that night. There was some level of risk, and we managed to take down that risk. And that's another, um, I wouldn't say point of contention, but... but a point where there isn't total agreement between Washington and New Delhi because India sees Pakistan as a state sponsor of terrorism. But uh, American policymakers uh, have been accused of ignoring India's concern vis-a-vis uh, -vis Pakistan. Um, do you sympathize with New Delhi's point of view more now? I, I wouldn't say more. No, I share the Indian view. I, I absolutely share the view. I, we, I worry about we, and we were very clear with Pakistan. We took an approach that was very different from the Obama administration's approach when we came in in 2017, uh, a very different approach to this. Now, we, we, share, we share not only the Indian view, but the global view of the risk of terrorism from uh, extremism inside of Pakistan, extremism that flows in uh, from Afghanistan via Pakistan. Now, these are very real risks that the Indian people are right to address. Pakistan has recently conducted what they call an election. 
uh, we've seen a lot of rigging, we've seen a lot of confusion, we've seen political persecution. Uh, uh, and yet the U.S. State Department has, and I'm, I'm quoting from what they've said, they've called the Pakistan elections competitive, and they've said it many times. They've used the same word, competitive. Do you agree with this assessment? Do you think that this was a free and fair election? I don't know enough to know. I mean, I just, I don't, I don't have access to the details of what took place there. I've watched Pakistani elections before. I've watched the enormous influence of the Pakistani army in those elections. Um, I, I would hope that they would become wh whatever level of uh, freeness and fairness there were in that particular election, the Pakistan, Pakistan needs to do better. And I hope that they will. A recent news report claimed that uh, President Donald Trump ordered the CIA to smear the Chinese government on their social media and the operation is said to have started in 2019 when you were in office. Were you aware about it? So I wasn't the CIA director in 2019. But you were part of the core team of Donald Trump. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I don't talk about CIA operations. Did you know that there was such an operation that it's out in the public I, don't, I, don't, I understand. The New York Times says lots of things. Yeah. Most of it is, is false and silly. Uh, it's a it's a disreputable institution. No, it just it, you can smile and laugh. It, it I it, it, for two and a half years we suffered under the Russia hoax, a story that somehow Donald Trump was a Russian asset. President Trump was a Russian asset, and the United States suffered under that. And the New York Times and the Washington Post, they they propagated that along with CNN International, which you all have to watch sadly. Right? No, I know it's you 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 smile. This is the reality that an administration like ours uh, had to endure propagating falsehoods. And so uh, when people ask me about things the New York Times read, I just I say, you know, that's the great thing about the First Amendment. The New York Times gets to write what it so chooses. Absolutely. Uh, the other thing is TikTok. It's a big issue in the U.S. election. Yes, um, you all banned it. Good for you. Yes, we banned it long <laughs> back, and the rest of the world is now coming uh, uh, to realize what sort of a challenge slash threat it poses. Uh, it's also a big issue between the U.S. and China, and President Trump wanted to ban it in 2020 as well. Uh, the, the current administration, I think, cannot decide what it wants to do, because on the one hand, they, they want a, yeah. like a ban. On the other hand, the president is now on TikTok. He has an account because a lot of young people are there. Do you, do you support a nationwide ban in the U.S. on TikTok? In the end, uh, the problem isn't TikTok. The problem is the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and the Chinese Communist Party ought not to have any capacity, any capacity, to shape the minds and beliefs and core understandings of young people in the United States of America. So if you start with that principle, what does that mean? It means they can't run a social media company inside of your country. Uh, and so, uh, yes, we should ensure that whatever TikTok is, a bunch of code, uh, an algorithm, uh, a bunch of uh, short little dance videos, whatever, whatever it turns out to be, I'm, I'm fine with all of that. Knock, knock yourself out. Have an algorithm, have dance videos, but they can't be owned by the People's Liberation Army. They can't be owned by an entity that is working to destroy the very way of life we have in the United States of America. So this is pretty simple for me. It's what we began I'll get the timing wrong, but I think in the spring of 20, or maybe it was the summer of 2020, we began to separate the stuff of TikTok from the evil of the Chinese Communist Party. That's what needs to happen here, whether it's a spinoff or a business transaction. I'll leave to the commercial players involved. I, I think there's a model there that probably works and actually creates a value. Uh, but you can't have the Chinese Communist Party operating a propaganda machine inside of your country. It's not just TikTok. We had to close the Chinese consulate in Houston, Texas. They were conducting a massive espionage operation there. So it wasn't TikTok. It was a bunch of diplomats, or at least people who claimed to be diplomats, spying on the United States. We have to confront the Chinese Communist Party inside of the United States with enormous vigor. Let me rephrase it. Would you support a ban on TikTok in the current form in, the w in which the company right now operates in the U.S.? The, the answer is yes. If the answer is it's going to be owned by the Chinese Communist Party, we ought not let that happen. I, but I, I, I try to be careful. You use the word ban intentionally because that gets everybody's dander up. It's not about banning anything that some young kid decides they want to do to show how cute they are, how fun they are. It's not, about, it's not about the content. It's not about the memes or the narratives or the dances. It's about the ownership foisting information on our young people and then extracting data from them. We can't let an adversary country do that to us. 
You've also said that the Chinese president's real mission was to get you fired. What gave you that impression? Uh, I don't want to talk about the details, but there was no doubt about that. He, he viewed me as someone who was serious about protecting America. And that meant for Xi Jinping, that means uh, adverse to him. And I was pretty clear, transparent about it. I spoke about it many, many times. The, the confrontation that the Chinese Communist Party presents not only to the United States, but to every democracy, including this one, is real and serious. And we have a responsibility to protect our own people from them. And I think he saw that. And so he thought maybe we can try again. Maybe we can go back to the pile and get someone who doesn't share that same understanding. I don't think so, because I think President Trump shared that understanding as well. And I think he still does. That's interesting. Uh, do you hold China responsible for the COVID-19 pandemic? And do you think that the world has done enough to hold it accountable? And if you were to go to, to be in office again, uh, would you take it up again? So you had two questions. The first answer is yes, and the second one is no. So the first question was, um, is the Chinese Communist Party responsible for COVID? The answer is yes, and I'll elaborate. Uh, because that's important. And second, has enough been done to hold them accountable? The answer is not remotely close. Uh, but now they haven't been held accountable in any material way. The World Health Organization is still run by the same guy who's told us that the Chinese were doing a great job in protecting the world. We should never forget that. Yes. He's still in charge today. Imagine the next pandemic. Same guy, same country, same Wuhan lab. When I say that China's responsible, um, they, they created this virus in a laboratory. The virus escaped accidentally, not intentionally, but it escaped from that laboratory. For that, accidents happen. They probably didn't do enough. But in any event, that was not an intentional release. But what was absolutely intentional is everything they did from the moment they became aware that the virus was running around the world, a relatively contagious, relatively lethal virus running around the world. They did everything they could to deny the world the capacity to protect the innocent people who died as a result of this virus. They hid the story, they disappeared journalists, they disappeared doctors, all the things that no nation, India wouldn't do this, America wouldn't do this. If we had an accidental release from a laboratory in one of our countries, we would immediately tell the whole world this is what happened. We would get the best minds in the world to try to address this, and we would do everything we could to contain this in the absolute moment, real time. These guys waited a very long time and then sent thousands of people around the world to transmit this virus, killing tens of, tens of millions of people, destroying billions of dollars worth of wealth, and setting the global economy back by at least a couple of years. Uh, no accountability to date for what Xi Jinping did to the world. I couldn't agree more. Uh, Russia or China, who do you think is America's biggest adversary at the moment? Oh, you know, rank ordering adversaries is a bad idea. You have to address them all. If you ask, the, if you ask which nation has the capacity to change the way that uh, your grandchildren live, or if I'm blessed and have grandchildren one day, um, it's the Chinese Communist Party. They have scale, they have a big economy, and they are intent on that as well. So it's not only capability, but intention. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt which of those two presents the greater long-term challenge to those of us who believe in basic human dignity and democracy. We're running out of time, but I have to ask you two questions. The first is on the Gaza war. Where do you think this is heading? And do you, do you agree with America's approach at the moment? I, I think President Biden has made a big mistake. I, I think telling the Israelis um, that they have behaved in a way that is indecent neither reflects the reality nor gets to the problem. The problem is the regime in Tehran. And when you tell the Israelis stop and you don't demand at the same vigor that the leaders of Hamas release the hostages, including American hostages, I think you embolden the bad guys. I think you embolden the terrorists who committed, I'm sure you've seen the videos. Um, I've seen some other videos that aren't public. I, I'm, I'm a tough guy. I've seen lots of bad things in my life. I've never seen anything like the horrors they inflicted on women that they encountered that day. It's, it was really hard to watch. They have to be eliminated. This is Israel's responsibility. And we need to make sure, America needs to make sure that Iran understands that we're not going to permit them to continue to terrorize the world in this day and rape women and kill innocent children and take hostages and use them as human shields in a way that is fundamentally different than anything that I have seen previously. This is our task. This is India's task. This is America's task to make sure that the regime in Iran doesn't believe they can get away with these kinds of atrocities. 
What about Ukraine? Do you think America should stop funding that war now? We should provide Ukrainians with what they need to defeat Vladimir Putin. That's not what the Republican Party thinks. Most, most Republicans do. No, most Republicans actually uh, understand this. Allowing Vladimir Putin to achieve victory in Europe tells Xi Jinping he has free reign to invade whatever nation he so chooses. You have an active conflict with him on your border here in India. Uh, we can't let that kind of message begin. No, no sovereign nation who believes in sovereign boundaries and human dignity can permit the kind of invasion that Vladimir Putin undertook. And so uh, the Ukrainians haven't asked for our soldiers, they haven't asked for our sailors, they've just asked for American financial support. We should provide this to them. And if we do it in the form of a loan, America has a long history of doing that as well. That seems fine to me as well. Um, but we should provide them the support they need to continue the fight that they've sacrificed so much um, that actually benefits America and India in important ways as well. We are out of time. Mike Pompeo, thank you very much yes, for your time thank and you. for speaking uh, so candidly about all the questions I asked. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you.